Okay, so all we are saying is give peas a chance. And just to recap, these are slides you've seen before, but this is what Mendel reasoned about his uh, experiments in heredity. There's some kind of little particles rattling around inside pea plants that determine what features, what traits the peas have. And we now call these elements genes. A gene may exist in more than one form and different forms of the same gene are called alleles. And an allele may be dominant or recessive. There are some other possibilities, but for right now, this will work. Uh, genes may have more than two alleles. Um, the experiments that Mendel did were with genes that, as far as he ever found, only had two alleles. Uh, but when you do experiments like this with a wider range of traits and critters, you find there are genes that may have three alleles, four, five, twelve. The largest number I can think of is one human gene with 26 different alleles. Uh, so they don't always have to be only two, but we'll start with single genes with two alleles. Every pea plant has two of each of its genes because it got one from its male parent and one from its female parent and each plant will pass on one of each pair to each one of its offspring. Same is true for you. You have about 18,000 genes. You've got two of each, so about 36,000. One of each pair you got from mom, the other of each pair you got from dad, and you will pass on one of each pair to each one of your children if you have them. The two copies can be the same or each can be different. Uh, just like any two coins can either have both heads or both tails and they're the same or a head and a tail and they're different. When two copies of a gene are both the same, we call that individual that's got them homozygous. If they're different, we call that plant, that pea plant or what have you, heterozygous. Alleles may be dominant or recessive, and a dominant allele will cover up the existence of a recessive allele if there is one that's present. So those F1 pea plants had one dominant purple allele and one recessive white allele, but they all looked purple. If you're a heterozygous pea plant, the purple allele masks the presence of the white allele, but that white allele is still there and it can be passed on to the next generation. And finally, to work problems, we can represent dominant and recessive alleles of the same gene by capital and lowercase forms of the same letter. So if we're doing an experiment on crossing pea plants with different flower colors, we can call the dominant uh, flower color allele capital P and the recessive flower color allele lowercase p. Um, there's no particular reason why it has to be a letter P. We could call it a letter Q or you know, a letter Z or one of those Dr. Seuss letters in the book On Beyond Zebra, which is going out of print, the ones that he made up. You know, we could call it, you know, a, the Russian letter Ikratkeya if we wanted to. We can call it anything we want. But we use the capital form for a dominant allele and um, the lowercase form for a recessive allele. So the alleles that any given plant has can be represented by a pair of letters. So his first crosses look like this. Um, up at the top, you have a pure breeding purple flowered pea plant whose alleles we can represent as a pair of capital P's and a pr pure breeding white flowered pea plant whose alleles we can represent as lowercase P's. 
That's the parental generation. And then their offspring make up the F1 generation, each of which gets one purple allele from one parent and one white allele from the other parent Purple is dominant to white, so all of the flowers look purple, but they're heterozygous. They're carrying one purple allele from the parent on the left and one white allele from the parent on the right. Now, in the second generation, he crosses two of the F1 plants. They're both heterozygous. So there's four possibilities. One parent could contribute a dominant allele and the other parent could also contribute a dominant allele. One parent contributes a dominant and the other contributes a recessive. One parent contributes a recessive and the other contributes a dominant, which is the same thing. And both parents contribute a recessive. So there are four possible outcomes and they're all equally probable. Uh, that means that if you do this cross, a quarter of your plants will get a dominant allele from both parents. A quarter of your plants will get a dominant from one and a recessive from the other. A quarter of your plants will get a recessive from one and a dominant uh, from the other, which is the same thing that both, both of those would be heterozygotes. And then a quarter of your plants would get a recessive from both parents. It's exactly the same odds as if you were to flip two coins. Uh, if you do that a bunch of times, about a quarter of the time you'll get two heads, half the time you'll get a head and a tail, and a quarter of the time you'll get two tails. To make this a little easier to visualize, we can do draw up a little paper calculating device called a Punnett square, invented by a guy named Reginald Punnett. And that's all you have to know about Dr. Punnett. Okay, you start by drawing a square. That's a square, duh. And one of the parents, you write the alleles that it's carrying up at the top and the other parent, the alleles that it's carrying, you write over to the left. So each parent contributes one of its pair of genes to each of its offspring. So the purple flowered pea plant can pass on either a purple or another purple, not both. You don't normally pass on two, ge two genes out of a pair. If you do, something's probably gone wrong and you'll end up with birth defects in the offspring. By the same token, the other parent is white flowered. It can only pass on a little p allele. So it will either pass on one of its little p alleles or it will pass on the other of its little p alleles. So that's what we write on the left side of the square. And now you fill in the square by moving the letters down and across. So we take the capital P from the top left and the lowercase p from the left top and move those into the that corner of the Punnett square. And we repeat for all four, sorry. So we end up with something like that. All that's telling us is that each of the offspring in this cross will end up with one purple allele from the parent at the top and one white allele from the parent at the left. They're all going to end up being heterozygous. All of the offspring are going to have one big P and one little P, and they're all going to look purple. Ooh, computer animated graphics. We are sophisticated here. By the way, the genotype of all of the offspring is going to be big P, little p. Genotype refers to what alleles an organism is carrying. Phenotype 
is the word that we use for what physical traits the organism has. So the phenotype of all of these offspring is purple flowers. The genotype of all of this offspring is big P, little p. If I ask you a test question, what is the genotype? The answer is going to be some combination of letters. If I ask you a test question about what is the phenotype, the answer is going to be some physical trait, purple flowers, or um, uh, comb shaped like a rose, if we're talking about chickens, or um, severe blood disorder that kills you in your teens, if we're talking about humans with the condition thalassemia or it'll be some kind of physical feature that you've got is the phenotype. So the phenotype of all of these offspring is purple flowers. Now here's how we set this up for the F2 generation. We draw our square again. On the top, we put one of these heterozygous uh, purple flowered pea plants whose genotype is big P, little p. And on the left, we put big P, little p right here. This is the other parent that's heterozygous. Okay, slight little glitch in the animation there, but each parent can contribute to its offspring either a big P or a little p, not normally both. So now we fill in the square by moving these letters down and across. So what goes in here is a big P from above and a little p from the left. That corner of the Punnett square corresponds to offspring that inherited a dominant purple flower allele from both parents. At the lower left, those are the uh, offspring that inherited a dominant purple allele from one parent and a recessive white flower color allele from the other parent. Up at the top right, you have the plants that inherited a recessive white allele from one parent and a dominant purple from the other. And by the way, I could write this lowercase p, capital P, and it would mean the same, but the convention is we usually write the dominance ahead of the recessives. Uh, there's no difference in this case which parent gives you the purple and which parent gives you the white allele, it means exactly the same thing. So we usually write the dominant first. And then in the lower right square, that represents the offspring that got a recessive allele from both parents. So what you get is a quarter of your offspring, 25% of your F2 plants, are going to be homozygous dominant. 50% of them, two out of four, will be heterozygous. And 25%, one out of four, are going to be homozygous recessive. So if you look at the phenotypes, three out of four offspring will have the purple flowered phenotype. There. Three out of four offspring will have the purple flowered phenotype. One out of four will have the white flowered phenotype. And that's exactly what Mendel found when he did this cross, right? That uh, he got almost exactly three purple flowered pea plants for every white flowered pea plant. One out of four is going to be a homozygous purple with the genotype big P, little p. Two out of four will be heterozygous and have the genotype big P, little p. And one out of four will be a homozygous white flowered pea plant. Ooh, computer animation. Okay, there we go. Okay, stop the computer animation. Come on. Okay, there. All right, I'll tell you what. 
I'm going to take a momentary break from this and I want to cut over to the practice problems that I've just given you, which look like this. And I'm going to work one A and B, and I'm going to do it on the whiteboard. Um, most corn plants have green leaves, but there are some that have a pattern of green and white stripes on the leaves. And that trait happens to be called IOJAP for some reason. Uh, I think the IO in IOJAP is called that because it was developed at the University of Iowa, which is very, very big on corn. Uh, I'm not sure what the JAP means, but that pattern of striped green and white leaves in corn happens to be called IOJAP. So question 1A, a plant breeder crosses a green leaf corn plant with an IOJAP corn plant and finds that the offspring all have green leaves, which is dominant. Okay. Well, you cross a green leaf corn plant with an IOJAP and the offspring all have green leaves. Green is dominant to IOJAP. That was fairly easy. That's the same logic as when Mendel crossed a purple flowered and a white flowered pea plant and got all purples. So B, the breeder takes one of the hybrid corn plants and crosses it with an IOJAP plant. So we predict the results of this cross using a Punnett square. All right. Okay. Hi, sweetie. So let's predict the results using a Punnett square, indicate the genotypes and the phenotypes in the correct ratio. Uh, let's go over here to the whiteboard. And let's see how we do this. So we're crossing. We can use any symbol we want. It doesn't really matter. So I'm going to use capital G for green leaves and lowercase g for striped or IOJAP leaves. OK. You could use any letter you wanted to. Uh, G might help you to remember that we're talking about green leaves, but it's not really that important. Okay, so the first cross we did was you cross a green and an IOJAP plant. Well, that green plant probably has the genotype big G, big G. And if we cross that with a plant that has the genotype little g, little g, all of the offspring are going to get one big G 100% of the offspring are going to get a big G from one parent and a little g from the other. And they'll be heterozygous. Their phenotype is going to be green leaves. But now we want to cross one of these plants from the F1 generation, a big G, little g. And we're crossing that with an IOJAP plant. And the IOJAP plant has to have the genotype little g, little g. So what do we get? Well, let's go ahead and draw the Punnett square. So there's a square. All right, up here at the top, we write the genotype of the first parent that we're going to cross. It doesn't really matter who goes on top and who goes on the left. So there's one of our parent corns. And there's the other parent corn. Now this parent up here at the top, this guy, he can pass on either his big G or he can pass on his little g, not both. So we write either a big G on one side, a little g on the other, and we can draw a line to create a column. This parent down here can pass on either a little g or another little g. 
not, not really a choice there. So we put a little g above, a little g below, and we draw a line to make two rows, and we have a two by two Punnett square. Okay, now we fill in down and across. So I can take you know, this big G and move it down here, and this little G and move it in from the left. And what I get is big G, little G. I take this little G and move it down and this little G and move it from the left and I get little g, little g. I take this big G and move it down and this little g and move it from the left and I get big G, little g. And I take this little g and move it down and this little g and move it from the left. You're always moving these letters uh, down and to the left. And I get little g, little g. So what does this mean? Half of our boxes, two out of four, have a big G, little g in them. And the other half have a little g, little g in them. So the interpretation is that 50% of the offspring bring, will have the genotype big G, little g, and the phenotype of green leaves. And 50% of the offspring will have the genotype little g, little g, and the phenotype of IOJAP leaves or striped leaves. So that's how you set one of those up. Okay, right. Everybody's still with me. That's pretty easy. It gets a little trickier when we go to problems where we have to do two at a time. Here's a cross. Mendel crossbred a pea plant that had peas that were yellow and smooth with a pea that had peas, with a plant that had peas that were wrinkled and green. So we can do a Punnett square here. Mendel had already established by some other crosses that he'd done that the allele for yellow peas is dominant to the allele for green peas and the allele for round is dominant to the allele for wrinkled peas. So here are the genotypes. There. Okay. We can represent a pea plant that has round and yellow seeds with the genotype big Y, big Y, big S, big S. And a pea plant that has the uh, wrinkled and green phenotype has the genotype little y, little y, little s, little s. Each parent contributes one of each pair of alleles, one of each pair, not normally both. So the yellow smooth parent can contribute only a capital Y allele and a capital S allele. All of this parent's eggs or sperm will only contain one capital Y and one capital S. The green and wrinkled parent can only contribute little y, little s to each of its offspring. So what we have here is a four by four Punnett square that looks like this. All of the F1 offspring got a capital Y and a capital S from one parent, and they all got a um, lowercase y, lowercase s from the other parent. So each one of these offspring got an allele for yellow peas and allele for smooth peas from one parent, and they got an allele for green peas and an allele for wrinkled peas from the other parent. 
They all have the genotype that we can write big Y, little y, big S, little s. They're heterozygous for both genes. And they all have the phenotype smooth yellow peas. Where things get fun is when you cross two of the F1 plants. Both of your F1s have the genotype big Y, little y, big S, little s. So what happens when we cross them with each other? Well, each parent contributes one of each pair of alleles that it has. So the parent on the left can pass on its capital Y and its capital S, right? It's alleles for yellow and it's alleles for smooth. Or it can pass on its allele for yellow and its allele for wrinkled, big Y, little s. Or it can pass on its allele for green and its allele for smooth. That's little y, big s. Or it can pass on its little y allele for green and its little s allele for wrinkled. In fact, both parents can contribute any one of four possible allele combinations. Students at this stage will often do a problem where you know, they might write what a parent can pass on big Y, little y. Well, it can't. You pass on one of each pair. You don't pass on two of a pair. Quick little thing that you've already been exposed to if you took high school algebra, as I assume you all did. Look up here where we're, what's written is big Y, little y, big S, little s. That's two pairs. The possible combinations that this pea plant can pass on it can pass on the first of each pair, that's big Y, big S, or the outermost of each pair, big Y, little s, or the innermost of each pair, little Y, big S, or the last of each pair. Anybody remember this now? First, outer, inner, last, the FOIL method for multiplying, uh, multiplying binomials, yes? Foil, first, outer, inner, last, it works here too. So each parent can contribute four possible allele combinations. Fill in the Punnett square down and across, and what you get is this. It's a lot more interesting Punnett square than the one that we did where every square had big Y, little y, big S, little s. What you find if you work out the phenotypes is that nine out of 16 of your offspring, which works out to what, I think 56% are going to have yellow smooth peas, right? They will have at least, you know, both the gene for the gene for color of the pea and gene for texture of the pea, both of those, they have at least one dominant allele. Whoops, went backwards. Right, so nine out of your 16 are gonna be yellow and smooth. Three out of your 16, you can see there's one right here that has capital Y, capital Y, little s, little s and two that have capital Y, lowercase y, little s, little s. Those correspond to three out of your 16 uh, pea plants, uh, which works out to what? Um, 34, 37, that's about 17% are going to be yellow but wrinkled. And then three out of 16, the ones that say little y, little y, big S, big S, or little y, little y, big S, little s, those are going to be green and smooth. And then only one out of the 16 is going to be homozygous recessive for both genes and be little y, little y, little s, little s, and have a green wrinkled phenotype. So what you get is this ratio of nine to three to three to one. Out of every 16 of the offspring, about nine should be yellow and smooth, 
three yellow wrinkled, three green smooth, and one green wrinkled. All right, checking to see how I'm doing on time. All right. Um, okay. I'm going to go ahead and show you the last couple slides. Uh, when we meet again on Monday, I might work another one of the practice problems for you. This does take some wood shedding, and I feel like I'm not teaching it as effectively on computer as I would if we had a blackboard and some chalk. But stick with it. Try to power through some of the practice problems to show that you've understood how to do these. Mendel announced his findings in 1865 published them in 1866. Uh, if anybody feels like reading his original paper, uh, it's still around. Uh, he wrote it in German, but um, it's been translated, of course. The problem is that his work was mostly ignored for the next 35 years. He published it. Okay, scientists, when we make discoveries, we don't except in a few cases, we don't usually, you know, call press conferences or something like that. Um, most science gets communicated to other scientists in journals, um, basically magazines, uh, usually printed like magazines, although these days a lot of journals are online only or they're primarily online. <laughs> and we publish articles in these journals. Um, Mendel published his results in a journal that not many people read. Uh, he sent copies to various people. Most of them ignored what he had done. And unfortunately, Mendel wanted to keep going and do more experiments that might work out more about what these genes things were uh, he did start some experiments that seemed to show that the same principles that he found in pea plants work in other species of plant. Unfortunately, in 1868, he got elected head of his monastery. He became the abbot. And he ended up spending the rest of his life admit running the monastery which in that day and age involved getting into political controversies with the government of Austria-Hungary. Uh, I don't really know what that was about. Any of you history majors might know better than I. But suffice it to say that he died in 1884 and he never got to go back and, you know, complete his work. But a guy in the 1890s named Hugo de Vries uh, from the Netherlands, independently of Mendel, started doing some breeding experiments with a different flower. Uh, this is what it looks like. Uh, it's a European wildflower called the evening primrose, a uh, rather attractive flower. And he happened to rediscover some of what Mendel had found. Uh, he argued that traits were inherited not like blending, right? You know, the offspring of two parents is not a blend. It's not like mixing paint. But traits had to be inherited as some little particles that retained their identity. Uh, genetics is more like mixing marbles than mixing paint. And he's the one who coined the word gene for these little theoretical particles of heredity. Mendel had just called them elementen, elements in German. Uh, de Vries called them intracellular pangenes, which we have since whittled down to just genes. And then in 1900, de Vries happened to find a copy of Mendel's original paper from 35 years ago and realized that he'd been repeating a lot of Mendel's work. De Vries kept working with his primroses. He alerted other scientists to this. They started doing breeding experiments with other species of plants and breeding experiments with animals. And they soon revealed that Mendel's basic laws of heredity applied to virtually all eukaryotes, including humans. Uh, that human 
traits, including severe human diseases in some case, followed Mendel's rules, uh, that they were governed by the presence of genes that came in dominant or recessive alleles. Uh, we'll actually see some examples of this going ahead. Um, I think I've already mentioned uh, that when I sat in on my crushes medical school classes back in 1992. One of the classes involved interviewing a patient that had a family history of a severe disease called Huntington's disease and using the same laws that Mendel worked out on pea plants to understand what this patient's chance of getting the disease was and what were the chances she could pass it on to her kids. Uh, this is serious stuff. Maybe you're not interested in peas, but the same rules apply to people. And they apply to um, basically all species of animal, plant, fungus, and protist. Bacteria, it's a little weird, and maybe we can get to that much later. Uh, but for all eukaryotes, with some wrinkles and modifications, Mendel's laws work. Mendel had actually worked out something fundamental about heredity by sitting in his monastery and growing his peas. We'll look at some of those wrinkles when we come back on Monday, and we'll work another practice problem or two, um, or I'll work it on the whiteboard. And for right now, I'm going to stop the recording. So we are stopping the recording.